the editor of the Miami Herald. You know, over the last four or five years, I've made several trips to Morocco. I have been up in the mountains of Ifran. I have been into the industrial heartland of Casablanca. But it's my first time in Marrakesh. And I've been told that it's the Miami of Morocco. And I am looking forward to enjoying some of that special Miami niceness and welcome. So I'm looking forward to enjoying that. But beyond that, uh, the Miami Herald, as many of you know, is one of the papers that looks really deeply at the South Atlantic. We're based in the United States in the North Atlantic, and we look to the South. To some extent, it's the same thing. My history is similar. I grew up in the Caribbean, in the South Atlantic. I now live in the United States, in the North Atlantic. And in the last several months, I have done a lot of what we're going to be doing here, talking not only about the region, but also traveling in it, from Bogota to London, from South Africa to Paris. And in addition to that, I've also talked to a number of world leaders talking about Atlantic dialogue. Now, I want to tell you in a few minutes about three or four reasons why I keep coming back to the Atlantic Dialogue. But before I do that, however, I want to talk about why it is so important to have all of you here this weekend. You know, about four, four years ago, the German Marshall Fund, in conjunction with the OCP Foundation, decided that they had had enough of the conversation that was more of a north-north access conversation. They wanted to get the south involved. As, as many of you know, sometimes when the north and the north, uh, when they're talking, they are often talking about the south, and the south is not engaged in that conversation. But OCP and German Marshall Fund wanted to do something different. And in the last three or four years, Think about what has happened. Just uh, two months ago, in Washington, D.C., President Obama invited the leaders of all of the African countries to come to Washington to have a conversation about trade and how the North and the South can work together. Coming out of that meeting, there were several successes. Uh, many of you know uh, Mr. Aliko from, um, from Nigeria. After that meeting, he said that they signed a deal for $5 billion to help power Africa. It was a deal that uh, he did with uh, Blackstone. And in listening to what he was saying, I remember that this sounds incredibly familiar. And I thought, where have I heard this before? Well. I heard it right here in Morocco three years ago when Mr. Trab from OCP showed this amazing map in which he said, this is Africa at night and the continent was pretty much dark. And he challenged all of us to work to help bring power to Africa. And we're starting to see that happening. In fact, uh, the $5 billion deal was signed and in addition to that deal, President Obama has been talking about his Power Africa initiative. He announced in Washington that it has been so successful that he was expanding his Power Africa initiative. That's just one thing that has happened since we have started meeting here. Just last week, East Africa and the European Union signed a deal to do trade to work together. So you're seeing things happening. In fact, I, I can't stand here and say that all of this happened because we have been meeting, whether we've been meeting in, in Rabat or here, but what, what seems to have happened is that these negotiations and these talks seem to have intensified since we have started, started meeting. And just think what has happened in the last few weeks with Ebola. President Obama is, has called out the U.S. military to help 
deal with the disease and to help the people of West Africa. Many of you know that in the past, there have been issues where, whether it's a crisis or a disaster happening in the South, and uh, the North, in some cases, has been totally absent, and in some cases, they have arrived to the crisis way too late. We are seeing a different, a change in mentality, and I would like to think that this, the discussions that we have been having here at the Atlantic Dialogue has had something to do with this change in attitude. So you all need to take some credit for that. In addition, I wanted to talk about the reasons that I keep coming back to the Atlantic Dialogue. The first reason is because in being here, I learn from all of you. You are some of the most creative and smartest people in the world dealing with issues around the Atlantic Basin. I love coming and listening to you and soaking up your knowledge. In fact, just this weekend, a very important election is taking place in Brazil. From my understanding, it's one of the most important elections that we'll be seeing around the Atlantic Basin in the next few years. And one of the people in this room has been deeply engaged in monitoring, analyzing those elections. And that's uh, Ambassador uh, Nevis, uh, Castro Nevis. Is he in the room? Uh, Mr. Ambassador, how are you? I wanted to ask you if you can share with our audience the importance of this election. Why do you think this election is so critical? What a surprise. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. Um, thanks, John. He's a very good friend. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the election that will take place next Sunday in, in, in Brazil uh, is a runoff of the presidential election and the general election at the beginning of this month. It will, uh, the Brazilian Electoral College uh, consists of about 142 million voters. Lot, in the first round, about 83% have indeed effectively voted. So it was a record in terms of participation. This is the most competitive election since 1989, the election uh, in which Mr. Collar won in the second, uh, in the runoff, uh, and by a margin of five percentage points. The polls indicate that uh, President Dilma Rousseff, the incumbent, is leading for approximately the same uh, number, 5% percentage points. But this, uh, uh, from 1989 to these days, the country has become more urban. Uh, the majority of the population for the first time in its history is part of the middle class and up. And uh, for the first time in many years since I remember, it's, uh, it was not just a mere choices of names, but uh, for the first time, public policies were discussed in the several debates, and today is the last debate between the two candidates. And these public policies has to do also with something which is very uh, uh, incipient in Brazilian politics, which is foreign policy, which is international relations. Brazil has been traditionally been a very inward-looking country, but International relations and Brazilian foreign policy, although uh, most politicians don't pay uh, adequate attention to it, is increasing its importance. It's increasing in the globalized world, in the world in which the processes of production have become more and more international, in the world where the global, uh, the global uh, value chains are having an increasing importance, uh, in a world in, in which many Brazilian enterprises are becoming international because they have to become international, they have to integrate to a certain extent to the rest of the world. Brazil cannot be a sort of a, an island in this. Uh, so therefore, it is important because it, it may affect, given the, the fact that Brazil is the largest country of the hemisphere after the United States of America, that 
most probably even unwilling decisions taken by the future Brazilian government will certainly, to an extent or another, affect our neighbors, affect our neighbors the other side of the ocean, the African West, the West African uh, states, and also uh, our relationship with uh, the United States of America. Thank you very much, Mr. Ambassador. We appreciate it. I wanted uh, to, uh, by the way, uh, uh, Mr. Ambassador has also served in Japan and China, among other places, and I really appreciate your analysis. Another reason why I keep coming back to the Atlantic Dialogues is so that I can help share the knowledge that I've gained over the years with emerging leaders. Last year when I was here, I was asked to speak to the OCP and German Marshall Fund Young Leaders Group. And it was the most impressive group of people that I've ever spoken with. And I'm really delighted that one of them is in the room today. Is Estelle here? Uh, oh, there you are. Uh, Estelle, I wanted to ask you, uh, Estelle is a television journalist in Paris, and I wanted to ask you, why is it so important for you to come to the Atlantic Dialogues? Uh, merci, John. I had been prepared before, so I'm slightly <laughs> less surprised <laughs> about Mr. Ambassador. Um, what I like about the Atlantic Dialogue is uh, the fact that we celebrate uh, our diversity, that we all take the time to come together and talk and listen. I think that if you look around, you see all sorts of uh, shades of skin color, and that's fabulous. You hear all sorts of languages being spoken, people with different political views, religions, who come together, take the time, share views, share analysis. That's really precious. That's also inspiring. That's also uplifting. And I think that we have uh, more in common than just an ocean. There's a lot of uh, hopes, dreams, projects, and uh, I think that's very positive and something that uh, we need these days. Thank you very much, Estelle. Now, another reason why I come to the Atlantic Dialogues is to create and make friendships. When I was here last year, one of the people I met was Julissa Reynoso. She's a U.S. ambassador to Uruguay. Since I was here, uh, I visited with uh, Julissa in Uruguay, and she's visited with me in Miami. And she's someone who I've admired for a long time because she was an assistant U.S. Secretary of State and worked very closely on issues in Cuba. And as I mentioned earlier, at the Miami Herald, we look deeply at what happens in Latin America and the Caribbean. Another, friend that who's, uh, another person whose friendship has deepened at the Atlantic Dialogues is Jorge Castaneda. Is Jorge in the room? Uh, he is back here. OK. Now, Jorge and I have had dinner many times in Miami, and, um, and I'm really glad to see this guy. And, and uh, please, if you don't mind standing. And I want him to talk about why this conference is so important to him and why he wants to come back. He's been coming out here for how long? This is my third time here. Not sure about the Miami and Marrakesh uh, <laughs> comparison there, John. We'll, we'll, we'll reflect on that a little bit, but it was a good try anyway. Uh, no, very, very briefly, I, I love coming to these meetings. One, because the substance is great. I mean, the discussions are really substantive. They're interesting. You learn things, and I think it's, it's a very wor well worth uh, <clears throat> devotion of time and energy and everything. Secondly, because the company is great. The people who are here year in, year out are interesting, intelligent, willing to share what they know, what they think, what they feel. Uh, the places are great, though I do think Marrakesh is better than Rabat, absolutely. <laughs> I, I don't think anybody could uh, disagree with that except if they're from Rabat. <laughs> and uh, most of the time, almost all of the time, the food is very good. And when there is wine, it's also mostly good. <laughs> Thank you, Jorge. He's, uh, he's special. You know, I, I couldn't help but noticing <laughs> President Obasanjo in the audience and talking about traveling around uh, the uh, Atlantic Basin. I have been to both of uh, President Obasanjo's inaugurals. The second one I thought was particularly special because one of your former advisors invited me to uh, a, the, a church service on the morning of the second inaugural at Asa Rock, the equivalent of 
the Nigerian White House compound. And, um, and I was expecting all of the leaders, the religious leaders in, in Nigeria to be in the room to bless this man and wish him a happy and successful second term. Instead, I got in and he got up at the beginning of the service and he didn't sit down until the end because he said the homily, he led the choir, and uh, he said everything, he did everything that you would expect at, uh, at a church service. And I left thinking, this guy is pretty special. So, good to see you, Mr. President, as usual. Thank you very much for being here. You know, in talking about being special, there's someone else who is very special. A year ago, when we gathered in Rabat, there was someone else up here speaking to you, setting the stage for what we were about to do. His name, Kumla Damor. I, after the, the, his, his um, uh, prologue, he and I became good friends. Uh, he, uh, we exchanged emails often. We followed each other on Twitter. And not long after, sadly, Kumla passed away. And Kumla was a friend not just to me, not just his colleague, but he was a friend to all of us. And if you would join me for a minute, if we can have a moment of silence in honor of our friend, Kumla Damore. Thank you very much. You know, I wanted to, to end by saying something that uh, Mustafa Tarab said often at these Atlantic Dialogues. He said, these discussions are not about us up here, the moderators or the facilitators. These discussions are about you. You are the stars of the show. And for whatever reason, you come, we're really delighted that you're here. And we hope that this weekend, you take full advantage of the opportunity. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very, very much. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the President of the German Marshall Fund of the United States, Dr. Karen Donfried. Well, John, thank you very much for that wonderful opening. I think you did a great job of highlighting the substance of what we're trying to get at at the Atlantic Dialogues, but also the importance of all of the relationships that are forged over the weekend here. So thanks so much for getting us off to such a great start. Ministers, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, friends and colleagues, a very warm welcome to Atlantic Dialogues 2014 and a very warm welcome to Marrakesh. It's just wonderful to have all of you here for this third edition of Atlantic Dialogues. I want to begin by saying how proud we are to organize this conference under the high patronage of His Majesty King Mohammed VI. When King Mohammed VI visited Washington last November, President Obama and he reaffirmed the strong and mutually beneficial partnership and strategic alliance between the United States and the Kingdom of Morocco. The German Marshall Fund of the United States is thrilled to be back in Morocco. I have the special pleasure of visiting this wonderful country for the first time. The United States and Morocco are both Atlantic countries. And as the recent visit of the king makes clear, our two countries are close partners. In keeping with that spirit, GMF and the OCP Policy Center share a transatlantic vocation. Together, we want to encourage all of you to look at transatlantic relations through a broader prism to include the United States, Europe, Atlantic Africa, and Latin America and the Caribbean. I wish to especially acknowledge the visionary role of GMF's friend, 
Dr. Mustafa Tarab, Chairman and CEO of the OCP Group and President of the OCP Foundation. Dr. Tarab's partnership with GMF has been extraordinary. And without his leadership and his commitment, we would not be convening here today. I would also like to extend a special welcome to the members of the Moroccan government who will be joining us over the weekend. Thank you so much for your attendance. After becoming president of GMF, GMF six months ago, my goal has been to deepen our organization's very successful work in the transatlantic space. As the world changes, so too has the role of the transatlantic relationship. The coming decade is likely to bring significant rebalancing of relations around and within the Atlantic space, with the South Atlantic playing a larger role in political, economic, and security terms. Central to understanding and reacting to these changes is engaging the wider Atlantic region in the work that we do. Central to that work has been the continued and close partnership with the OCP Policy Center in organizing the Atlantic Dialogues. I'm pleased to say that our cooperation extends far beyond this wonderful conference. Our two organizations are partners in a number of important areas, and we strive to lead the discussion on the most important issues affecting our common Atlantic space. GMF and the OCP Policy Center, in that sense, are true partners in this important endeavor, and we very much value that. I want to especially thank Dr. Kareem El Ainawi and his colleagues and we look forward to our continued work together. We are delighted that many of you are returning to Atlantic Dialogues again this year. And I want to offer a special welcome to all of those who are joining us for the first time. All of you are part of an extraordinarily diverse and high-level group of policymakers, business leaders, and opinion shapers from Africa, the Americas, the Caribbean, and Europe. We are proud to welcome participants from over 50 countries of the wider Atlantic region. This impressive group will discuss in a variety of formats over the next few days the joint challenges and opportunities facing our shared region from security issues to trade, from an Ebola epidemic of historic proportions to maritime security. We are at an important inflection point in the history of our transatlantic community, and this forum gives us the opportunity to address the wider Atlantic's most important priorities. I'd like to highlight two special and important elements of this conference. The first is hitting a note that John already hit, which is that we're thrilled to welcome 45 emerging leaders from 24 countries of the Atlantic region. I had the great pleasure, together with Dr. El Ainawi, of welcoming the group over dinner on Wednesday evening. And that entire group is now participating in the Atlantic Dialogues as full participants. And I can tell you it is an extremely impressive group of emerging leaders. And we're thrilled to build on the launch of that program at last year's Atlantic Dialogues. So you'll hear from them over the course of the next few days and just a special welcome to all of you in that group. The second element that I wanted to highlight is that we will rein reintroduce you to AD Connect, which is a digital application debuted at last year's Dialogues. So those of you who are coming back will be familiar with it. Those of you who are new are probably wondering what I'm talking about. This AD Connect is an app that was designed by SpotMe 
to enrich the conference experience for participants. And what we're going to do, just to make sure everyone's comfortable with it, is right after this, have a short presentation to show you how to best take advantage of this application. And in case you're nervous about using it over the next couple of days, we're going to have a Spot Me representative who will be on stage after every main session and during coffee breaks to answer any questions you may have about how to use it. Now, for those of you who use and follow, follow Twitter, I want to encourage you to make use of hashtag Atlantic Dialogues to tweet about our weekend. And with that, let me give you a final thanks for joining us here in Marrakesh. And we'll see whether John or Jorge wins on the whether Marrakesh is the Miami of Morocco. But we certainly are delighted that all of you decided to join us here. I, for one, could not be more excited about spending the weekend with you and much look forward to the important and timely conversations we'll have over the course of this weekend. So with that, it is now my honor to introduce my colleague, Dr. Kareem El Ainawi, who is the Managing Director of the OCP Policy Center and advisor to the CEO and Chairman of the OCP Group, and also a very wonderful friend of GMF's. Uh, thank you, Karen. Uh, Minister, excellencies, ministers, uh, ambassadors, and friends, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, this is a real pleasure to be here. Um, uh, this is about uh, ecosystems and uh, nurturing and trying to change the course of, uh, of event as much as we can. Uh, if you take the policy center as an example, the policy center is a baby of the Atlantic Dialogues. It all started uh, you know, with the idea of our chairman, Mustafa Tarab, of you know, uh, the broad vision of doing things together uh, and converging, uh, trying to catch up uh, as, you know, our living standards and living together in peace and stability. Uh, we felt at some point in time that for sustainability, uh, for this to be to last, and this to be an engine of energy uh, to create a, a think tank. And here you have uh, OCP Policy Center, which had one staff, myself, and I think uh, Samia, that's maybe around last year at the same time. We are now a group of 12. Uh, we are, have uh, nine resident fellows, non-resident fellows, and it will continue. Uh, and that's not to advertise about the Policy Center, but just to tell you that uh, these are concrete steps, and that we are fully aware that it is a long-term adventure, uh, and that uh, maybe current affairs in international relations today are more characterized by short-termism and managing the how to manage the next crisis. We are here committed. We are dear friends from GMF, uh, and from for, with you also uh, to make this a sustainable effort, uh, and because we see this as a potential. Uh, to uh, improve the living standard in this uh, great, uh, great region. And this is, these are not just words. Uh, if you take Jan, my dear friend Jan Lesser, who my main counterpart in this, and of course, uh, you know, uh, Karen as well, uh, which we're very happy that he has joined us. We talk uh, over the phone, we speak uh, a couple of uh, times a week. Uh, we did uh, just, uh, uh, you know, you have a book in your hands, I hope you have it, on the Atlantic, uh, Atlantic Currents. This is uh, a joint analytical product. Uh, we will continue to produce this kind of, uh, of things. Uh, and uh, because we, if you take a few statistics that are out of the, books, the book, I think this is the first effort of putting the statistic in the perspective of the Atlantic. You just see s some striking numbers. Um, you know, the average GDP of the northern side of the Atlantic is about seven to eight times larger than the uh, southern Atlantic one. If you just believe in some catching up effects, you can see the potential returns of just converging for those economies. And converging is about Amos Ouattara. I'm not sure he's here. I hope he is. He's an emerging leader. We had dinner together uh, the other night. And also Jamie Boyd from Canada, 
They are the future of the Atlantic. Jamie Boyd is a trade specialist working from the Canadian government negotiating trade agreement. I don't know how old she is, but she's barely 30, I think. Are you here, Jamie? No? You're here. We had lunch together. She was sitting on my side. Uh, I was sitting on her side. Uh, and Amos Watara, I don't know where's Amos. Amos is a very successful investment banker from uh, Ivorian origin, working for the best firms in the banking industry. These are, if they can get together and agree how to channel the huge amount of private capital that is around the world and give it an appropriate platform with the regulatory framework that Jamie is going to provide, this is going to change tremendously the future of Africa, for instance. This is the main source of growth of the US. This is maybe the solution for European Union so protracted growth uh, prospects for the, for the coming future. And for this, we have to know each other. You know, um, I hope in two, three, five years they'll get together uh, and uh, they'll do this on the ground. And you said it, Karen, this is about the next generation. This is about these people knowing them, each other's. You know, Moroccans traditionally know, you know, if you ask me to pick up the phone, I will call in France easily, I may call in Washington because I lived. But calling Marcus in Brazil, now I know Marcus. But for, in general, we don't really know each other. We have, and this is here what we're trying to do. And the policy center is really a platform to do that. It is a platform for you, uh, the Atlantic Dialogue as well. So use us, bring your energy to the table. Together with GMF, we try to put a sort of, uh, you know, a framework, whatever you name it, a platform and a, you know, sort of, I don't have the right word, but something that is very open, that is ready to receive your energy, and that together we can, we can fulfill those goals of, you know, a, a sustained economic development. How do we, do we organize, do we facilitate catch-up growth for all these regions? So it is about leadership, it is about entrepreneurship, it is about the next generation. So we're trying to put all this together and to, uh, to make it happen. And we believe in the power of dialogue and people to people and human relations, because in the end, of course, you know, uh, the world has changed, we are more interdependent, and at the same time, it means that the solutions are more common solutions, uh, uh, just a, a number out of the book. Atlantic uh, countries trade among themselves, 75% of their tr total trade is among themselves. This is a fantastic potential to improve all that. So, but we need to know each other better and we need to continue to invest. And the message I wanted to convey is that we will continue to, to invest. This is the third edition. There are many other ways we can continue this effort together, all together here, uh, using the, the, the sort of, 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 of base we created with, uh, with our dear friend from, from GMF. And we truly believe here from Morocco, which is a middle income country, of say five, six thousand dollar GDP in purchasing power parity terms, uh, that this is a low risk, high return investment. It's a low risk, high return investment. You don't need much to trigger change. And particularly uh, the catching up and the huge potential that you have from the uh, African continent which is uh, you know, the next frontier for, of, for development. And we have also this experience. As I told you, this is about ecosystem. This is about nurturing. This is about you know, creating babies and letting them go. And this is uh, um, you know, just the initial impetus that is, uh, that is, clearly, uh, that is clearly important. And uh, uh, so I'm going to stop here. I would like to thank you again and uh, to invite you to you know, discuss, to dialogue. I have colleagues here, myself, everybody. Uh, and uh, thank you, uh, Karen. Thank you, all the friends from GMF. Thank you for those who came from far away. We're very happy to have you here. Uh, and thank you for being with us. Thanks. Now we want to start the first plenary session of Atlantic Dialogues. And I'm going to invite another terrific colleague of mine, Dr. Ian Lesser, to come up because Ian is the moderator of this session. And one of the things that was flagged in the Spot Me presentation was Atlantic Currents, 
which is truly an impressive publication. And Ian is one of the folks who contributed to that, which is evidence of the deep knowledge he has on the issues which we're covering over the weekend. But in his day job, he is the executive director of the Brussels office of GMF and our senior director for foreign and security policy. So over to you, Ian. Uh, welcome, welcome to all of you uh, for this first plenary session. Uh, and before we actually start our discussion on the New Atlantic Equation, Convergence, Cooperation, and Partnerships, we're going to play a, a short video for you. For the last century, the transatlantic relationship has been the most important partnership for both Europe and the United States. It has served as the foundation for global security, economic prosperity, good governance, and a shared commitment to democracy. However, with the emergence of new rising powers, the scope of the transatlantic landscape is shifting. As a result, the notion of transatlanticism is expanding to encompass all four continents surrounding the Atlantic Basin. Together, Atlantic countries have the opportunity to build a greater foundation for cooperation by capitalizing on the potential of both the North and South, harnessing the dynamism of diverse societies, and developing a collaborative environment for shared knowledge. What are the policy challenges where interests openly diverge? How can differences be addressed without leading to a disruption of the partnership? What are the venues for collaboration? Where do they work? Where do they fall short? What are the most pressing policy concerns for the wider Atlantic? Thank you. Uh, before I introduce our uh, panel here this afternoon, I just wanted to say a brief word about this session. In a way, this is, the, this is this opportunity to have the big picture conversation about the Atlantic, about our key themes, about uh, developments since the last Atlantic Dialogues, but things that we can look ahead to in the future, uh, to think through what it means to be an Atlantic actor. Is it about identity? Is it about interests? Is it about geography? Is it about history? What is it? Maybe all those things. Uh, are our visions of the Atlantic compatible? Are our visions of interest and identity compatible? Do they converge? Do they diverge? Maybe all of those things, but the conversation is well worth, is well worth having. We have an extraordinary group of people to help us launch this conversation uh, today. And let me introduce them very, very briefly. Uh, I know you have their bios, but we have, if I could start on the left, we have uh, Ambassador Yusuf Amrani, a head of mission of the Royal Cabinet here in Morocco. Uh, we have Esther Brimmer, uh, who is professor at uh, George Washington University and former Assistant Secretary of State. And we have uh, Ms. Laura Chinchilla, uh, former president of Costa Rica. Thank you. And uh, Miguel Angel Moratinos, former Minister of Foreign Affairs of Spain. So it's a great group with four different perspectives on some very important questions. And maybe I could start uh, first with you, Ambassador Imrani. Uh, we're here in Morocco. Uh, Morocco, is, Morocco has multiple identities, I think you'll agree. Uh, but one of those identities, and a very important one, is Atlantic. And so from your perspective, what is it that gives this significance for Morocco? And where do you see the important areas for this to go, these relationships to go in the future for Morocco? Very briefly. Okay, thank you very much. I think uh, uh, as far as Morocco and, and uh, we share the same values for democracy, for human rights. And this entitled this uh, country under the leadership uh, and the vision of His Majesty King Mohammed VI uh, to, uh, to, uh, to work together towards the Atlantic link. Today, the, uh, trans the Atlantic link is a priority in our foreign policy. And you, and you have seen in that pictures, we were the first country in Africa and in the Arab world to uh, have a strategic dialogue and partnership with the US, but not only with the US, uh, with other countries in America and America. Today I'm very happy because I, 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 they are in the room, they don't know it maybe, I have two ministers where, when in countries where I served, Castaneda, uh, former, former Minister of, of Mexico, I was ambassador to Mexico. I think there's also Arturo Sarujan, who was my colleague in the foreign ministry, he was here. But also the Minister of Defense of Colombia. I served also uh, as ambassador of Morocco to Colombia. So in fact, Morocco is a, 
believes strongly in this transatlantic lift because of our shared values, as I said in the beginning, but also because of our strategic location. We, are, we have established ourselves as a bridge to Europe through the Mediterranean, and later maybe we can talk about this, but also as a gateway to Africa with strong connections to America, to the Americas, if I may say so. Thank you. Esther, uh, you know, an American perspective on this. Um, you know, I was very struck, we mentioned Atlantic Currents, the volume that we've put together, together with the Policy Center. I'm very pleased to say Esther wrote one of the really excellent chapters and an excellent set of chapters, uh, but thank you. Uh, but I was very struck by a couple of points that you made in there about um, important but differing security perceptions around the region. And let's extend that to maybe to foreign policy more broadly. A lot of compatible shared interests perhaps, but a lot of different history and a lot of different perspectives on some important issues. So how, you know, is an Atlantic vision in this foreign and security policy space possible? Well, first, Ian, thank you very much for the question, and thanks both to OCP and to the German Marshall Fund for hosting the Atlantic Dialogues. This is a fantastic gathering, and I look forward to hearing what our panelists and the entire audience have to say about these topics. It may be because now I'm a professor, no longer a diplomat, <laughs> or because early in my life I was on the policy planning staff, so it's my job to be contrary. And so I'll ask five questions to say that I believe deeply in the potential for cooperation and for, for human progress. But in order to do that, we have to look at the difficult issues and work our way through them. And I think these five questions might suggest what those are. The first is the defense of the rule-based order. Many countries in the Atlantic space have seen their role as defending the larger international order and international system. You may argue it's hegemony, or you may argue it's actually being the first one to contribute to a Ebola response. Maybe it's, uh, it's being, uh, being out front on, or working on development issues. That said, one of the questions is, will emerging powers be part of the partnership in defending the rules-based order? And I think the response to the evasion of Ukraine gives many pause when answering that question. The second question, what will happen to the economic underpinnings of the transatlantic community? Many countries experience great growth, but in recent years we've seen return to challenging issues within the European Union challenges for many urban uh, uh, emerging countries as well. What will happen to the economic underpinnings and what choices will be made? Oh, will the models be the model of Mercosur? Will the model be the Trans-Pacific Partnership? What will be the dynamic models? What will be the impact of TTIP? And I think indeed, I would, uh, again, I thank the investor for raising the Brazilian elections. That'll be one of the places where this question will be answered about what economic choices many will make. I will also flag these uh, elections, particularly to the US Senate in November as well. Third, peace and security, perhaps the most difficult area where I see the largest divergences. The first is in the concept of sovereignty, that indeed you have in the European Union countries that have pooled sovereignty to a remarkable level. But also for many countries, including my own, sovereignty is a major political issue. And, uh, and so if we look at the very different views of the importance of sovereignty, we are different. I think also the importance of the NATO alliance, which is fundamental to security in the North Atlantic, and which is viewed with great skepticism and wariness by many in the wider Atlantic. That's gonna be a difficult issue and important to address. Different views of the path towards denuclearization. And if we look at uh, the importance of dealing with uh, ending the use of uh, the possession of, of nuclear weapons, we're all part of the non-proliferation treaty, but there's some very different views as we sit in a nuclear-free zone, yet nuclear weapons remain part of the Atlantic Alliance. What will happen to our global institutions? We have, of course, we're members of the United Nations, but also, what is the future of the Organization of American States? Or is the future UNASUR, which does not include the United States and Canada? What organizations will we work in? And finally, where can we make a contribution? And as I said at the beginning, I believe that we really are capable of human progress. I would flag two areas where I think our community can make a real contribution. One is in dealing with a new set of rules. Maybe just because we saw AD Connect, I would say particularly work on the new rules of the internet. And the second is a more f profound one. Who are we? Can we provide a positive narrative on identity? At a time when we hear about Novorostia dividing Eastern Europe, or when the Islamic State uses aberrations to murder those with whom it disagrees, can the transatlantic community in all of its rich diversity, despite at times our painful history, provide a positive understanding of cultural identity. I think we can. Thank you.
Esther, thank you. Ms. Chinchia, Costa Rica is a country with, it's a bioceanic country, um, like my country, the United <laughs> States. How do you think about this issue of Atlantic vocation and Atlantic identity? How do you balance those things? And from your perspective in your region, what are the things that will really matter, do you think, in working with Atlantic partners over the next years? Okay, yeah, um, I would like to, to, uh, to take the opportunity probably to emphasize uh, on, uh, um, on some of the issues that uh, were already mentioned, uh, but from the perspective of the Latin American countries and um, also from the perspective of the medium-sized and small economies uh, in our region. And um, um, concerning our um, major uh, challenges, uh, I would say that at least I would like to bring uh, three important topics. Uh, one is um, the future of the opportunities in terms of trade and investment as we know, we have now in Latin America uh, many economies that have been um, successfully performing in terms of trade open economies. Uh, and that is going to be a very important factor in face of a trend that we have here in the Atlantic, but also in the Pacific. And that has to be with the uh, mega regional trade agreements. I think. They are instruments that can either hinder or boost uh, the future economic development of our countries. Uh, the second issue that I would like to bring uh, in this occasion is the issue of climate change. Um, and uh, from the point of view of the small states in the Caribbean, we are, about, we are talking about 15 states in the Caribbean, and the small states uh, in Central America. Uh, this is a very serious and dramatic problem. I think they are paying a disproportionate uh, impact uh, when it comes to talk about the consequences of climate change. Uh, and finally, uh, the other issue is uh, security. Uh, and that means basically now for us in Latin America, the challenge of the transnational organized crime. Um, it is having a terrible impact, a devastated impact on the institutions in our region. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm conscious that all of you want to come into the conversation, and I am going to open it up in just a, just a second. But I just wanted to put a brief question to you all. And you, you know, think about it in different ways if you'd like. Uh, you know, one of the big animating issues across the North Atlantic in the last certainly the last year, but I think it's older than that, has been an issue of trust. Mm. We've had all kinds of crises, political crises, other things that have gotten in the way of this, and it's raised a question about trust. Definitely on the agenda, even in the traditional transatlantic relationships. What about in North-South terms? What about in this four continents relationship? Do we trust each other? Do we trust in each other enough to work confidently on trade or security or the environment or identity issues? What do we think? Yes. Please. I was brief at the beginning. I will take some more time now to maybe express. I think I said we share the same values, but we also share the same threats. Mm -hmm. Today, I think, uh, uh, as far as this continent is concerned, piracy is undermining the safety mm -hmm. of African states, especially in the Gulf of Guinea. Today, 30% of the cocaine which is exported to Guinea comes from the Gulf of Guinea, traffic on, on human beings. Now we have this issue of Ebola, which is threatening some African, African, African countries looking at the Atlantic. So I think today we can say we have a global threat and we need a global response. Two, I think Miguel Angel have uh, you know, uh, insisted on the Lanzarote initiative. At the beginning, we said, we are facing the same threat, and we need to have an approach. Miguel Angel did his homework, and he gathered some European African countries, and Morocco gathered the 23, 23 countries from looking at the, uh, the Atlantic from the African. And we said the same, we had the same vision, and we said we need a concerted and pragmatic, pragmatic, 
pragmatic approach to face these kind of challenges. Based on barriers, security, yes, it's important. We, we need trust to be able to work between intelligence, between the Ministry of Interior to fight the, this kind of threat. But security is not a unique response. We need, we need economic development. And this, I think, is the one of the priority of our program. Without creating jobs, without promoting growth, we cannot fight against terror, and we cannot uh, fight against poverty, which is now the source. And today, and Miguel Angel said, or oh, I've Chi, I was saying, there is a new world. There are new threats. Don't forget that we have close to ours, uh, Mujao, we have Al-Qaeda in the Sahel, and this is linked to the Atlantic and to the Atlantic and to the, to the Gulf of Guinea. Don't, all this traffic, the connection today is evident between the terrorists and, and, and uh, the radicalist movement in the Sahel and drug trafficking in Gulf of Guinea. So we need a balanced approach based on this tripular economic and human dimension. No. You were saying something important. We need some tools to be able to respond to this kind of threat. We need trust, of course, but we need tools. There are tools now. There are bilateral tools, Morocco, the US dialogue. We have been working with other friends from Latin America within this gathering of South American states, ASA and Africa, and South America it, and, and, and Arab world. This is a dialogue. But I think it's important also to look for some coherence. Because today, we have a lot of initiatives, and we need, we need to have coherent responses to this threat. So I think today, there is this new context that helps us to work together within you know, agreed perception, because I think there is no difference between us. We need economic development. But now, let me conclude by saying that today, Africa is a priority not only for Europe within this Afri Africa EU dialogue, which is not working, by the way, but it is a priority also for the other countries in, 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 in America, in North America and South America. President Obama, you, uh, somebody, yes, you pointed out very well that this year, for the first time, he gathers all the head of states of Africa and the US mm -hmm. because Africa is a country of opportunity for the future. We have possibilities of growth in the region. We have possibility of making business, because at the end of the day, to be able to fight terror, to fight poverty, is to create jobs, and to promote growth is to make business. And in this connection, Morocco, as I said, is a gateway to Africa. We have successful story doing business in Africa. I think this aspect is very important. Uh, I didn't want to make the conversation all about obstacles. I also wanted to talk about some opportunities, and that's actually a good opportunity uh, to shift to engaging all of you in the conversation. And and uh, we wanted to do this maybe just starting off using AD Connect. Uh, there can be a tag cloud exercise that we can do precisely on this question of opportunities. And so I would ask you, and I think my colleagues are primed to do this on the screen here. We'll do this very briefly, and then we're going to go to all of you for comments and questions. Uh, in a word. And I'll tell you how to do this. Tag cloud actions on AD Connect, and then you'll be able to type in a word and press send. Uh, but in a word, uh, what do you see as the biggest unexploited opportunity for cooperation around the Atlantic? In a word, what should we be doing? This is an obstacle. We're back to obstacles again. Let's move to, let's move to opportunities. Actually, yeah, there you go.
one of the great advantages of having confused my colleagues is that we actually got a wonderful combination of both opportunities and obstacles, uh, which actually uh, allows us to talk about some of the differences in perception, because obviously a lot of these things are both. Uh, but thank you all very much for contributing to that. We're going to save that. Uh, let me just turn to all of you now for very brief uh, comments and questions. And if you would just uh, tell us who you are and where you're from, when you do that, that would be great. And we have microphones uh, to come to you as well. Maybe, Marcus, you're right here. Let me start with you. My name is Marcos Freitas, I'm from Brazil. Good to see you again, Esther. Um, my question is this. Uh, when BRICS was established, one of the greatest difficulties was to set up a common agenda. And I think the Indians did a very good job at bringing development to the table. I think cooperation in the wider Atlantic is hard to find because if we don't find one common issue that could, we could start working on. You've listed several. Which one would you say is the most important one? Is it ending poverty like the World Bank's pursuing? Mm -hmm. Is it uh, drug trafficking? Or is it corruption, which is a common, thread, a common thread all over the world nowadays? Which would you single out as the most important item for cooperation? Mm -hmm. Thank you. So please, the priorities. <laughs> what do we pick? Well, what do we work on first? <laughs> well, um, of course, when we talk about any issue of the uh, global agenda, everything uh, has to do with the well-being of our people. Yeah. Um, uh, for example, um, one of, uh, of the uh, more common news on the international newspapers and many newspapers now is, has to do with migration. Um, but migration is not the problem. The problem is what is behind. Uh, the, uh, the immigration issue, why the people has to leave their countries. So I think, of course, we have the challenge of promoting a, a right development agenda so we can be able uh, to bring to our people a, a good nation uh, to make a living. Um, and from that point of view, I understand that we have common challenges to create the right environment inside of our nations. And we have many uh, common lessons probably to share and to learn from one each other. So how to create the best possible environment at home. But at the same time, uh, we have to use the international organizations uh, and the cooperation to help to create those conditions. So if I will be in the situation to choose just one at the international level, at the cooperation level. I will identify uh, trade. I will identify trade. And it's very interesting to see that people think that trade is the obstacle in the Atlantic. Probably if you had put there the Pacific, people had said it's the advantage. Uh, trade is the most important issue because it creates opportunity for prosperity in our nations. We only have two options, let me tell you. Or we export our people, or we export the goods that our people can produce. And so we have to create the right opportunities so in our countries we can have the production and we can get the markets to sell those services and those products. Okay. Let me uh, say something answering our colleague. I would say before tackling the priority, I'm talking from the southern perspective. I think we should do also our own homework before tackling the international community. And our own homework is yeah. regional yeah. integration. I think you were successful in Latin America to succeed in the uh, 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 regional integration. Centro de Integración en la Centro America, Mercosur, Comunidad Andina, you were successful. I think we need to do our own homework in Africa as far as building up a strong Maghreb and also the African community. As far as there, there are no priorities for the country of the South today, I think it's a balanced approach with it. Trade, yes, it's essential, but trade without security is nothing. Trade without trust is nothing. I think today, if I, if I have to choose a priority for us, 
is the human dimension of the development, education. This is the most important, to be able to fight against illegal migration. You remember, um, Moratinos, when we started this Rabat Pass on migration, we said, we cannot only use security measures to prevent migrants from Africa going to Europe. We need to invest in Africa. We need to create jobs in Africa. We need to promote growth in Africa, because security alone cannot. So for, for me, the human dimension is essential. When I say human dimension, it means education, agriculture, health. This is, I think, what the people, of course, and security to stabilize. I don't know if somebody was talking that we don't want to need any fragile state, states in the region. This issue of uh, the respect of independence of strong countries, because failed states cannot implement policies in this field. Let me go right over, right over here. Yes, please. If we could have a microphone just there, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Vishwanath, and I am a fellow of an Indian think tank called Gateway House from Mumbai. I wish to make a short comment. Uh, the presence of Costa Rica in the form of Senora Lara Sanchia, I think it gives a unique value addition to your Atlantic dialogues going beyond what you have put in the agenda. Here is a country which has abolished armed forces voluntarily on its own in the history of the modern world. It has set an example for the rest of the world. And this country, sitting in the midst of so much of uncertainty, instability, conflict, civil war, and it has survived and it has flourished, and it has set up a university of peace. I think it would be worthwhile for the Atlantic dialogue to add this to the agenda of course, United States, big powers cannot follow this example, but there are a number of countries which can certainly follow this one. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. It's a very, it's a very interesting point. Thank and one you that very much. <laughs> I mean, we, the, the North Atlantic produces a lot of big animating conflicts, and there may not be such animating conflicts in the South Atlantic, but it doesn't really mean it's a secure place, does it? I mean, if we talk about personal security or human security, Esther. Mm. Indeed. Uh, uh, first, uh, to uh, follow up on the... Uh, uh, presenter's question that and comment <coughs> that to say that at first and then to commend your particularly the, the remarkable example that, that your country has set, but to also commend many of the countries in the Atlantic region for their contribution to peacekeeping, <coughs> which uses the skills of military and police forces to help bring greater stability. And whether it's Brazil in Haiti or Congo or the Mediterranean or whether it's India's long and distinguished contribution to peacekeeping, there are roles, and the question is what are they and how, for the select use of military force. Indeed, the great cooperation in the Indian Ocean mm -hmm. to combat piracy, which brings together countries from very, very different parts of the world to combat piracy. There are these important models, and the question is when are those appropriate? How do we think about that? I think is, that is important as well. But indeed, human security, I think, is also important, which is understanding that ultimately it's not the well-being of states, but the well-being of people. So I was so happy that you added education to that list, yeah, yeah, because in yeah. addition to trade and investment, yeah, yeah. and I would say to health, yeah, yeah, I would add yeah, education, yeah, yeah. which is very much part of helping the next generation be, take leadership roles and providing opportunity and social inclusion for all of our societies. And all of countries, including my own, have work to do in this area. Elon. Yes, I want to, to answer the question, uh, which are the priorities to overcome the obstacles. Corruption, from my modest point of view, corruption is everywhere, unfortunately. Uh, opportunities, yes, trade, energy, nobody say about energy. But now, well, sometime when we used to call the Gulf, we were all thinking about the Persian or Arab Gulf. Well, we have to think about the Gulf of Guinea, in terms of yes. oil and gas today. People are shifting to the Gulf of Guinea, so there is a lot of potential trade, enormous potential. So the question for me, the priority is to combat ignorance, because people don't think what is going on today in Africa, and the possibilities, and secondly, you have to create connectivity. You cannot have a successful 
an intense uh, trade in the long harbor, communication, transport, and the way to really exchange goods and capitals and services. So if there is political will and there is uh, intention to create this new relationship, you will overcome. If not, we will continue like today, that we will have a good exchange of views today, yeah, exactly. but at the end, the lack of uh, knowledge of each other will continue. May I add something about NATO? I think it's important. I think NATO is now changing. And we with Moratinos, we worked a lot within the NATO Med Dialogue. And then came later on what they call the Istanbul Initiatives, which was an initiative of NATO looking at the Gulf. Today, as I, we was, we, I think we agreed, there is a need to maybe reshape the role of NATO because of the security threat and the development uh, uh, initiatives in the Southern Atlantic. Maybe NATO should think within the discussion today on the NSC, national, uh, the new security concept, that some importance given to the South Atlantic. While we could imagine, I think, a dialogue like with the Mediterranean partners with NATO, with the countries of the Atlantic, of the South Atlantic, like they have, you know, uh, Jose Miguel, what the kind of, of dialogue we have. Because today there is this Sahel, the situation in Sahel is linked to the Mediterranean, mm -hmm. and the situation in the Mediterranean is linked to the European. Security threats are the same. So that's why Morocco had made some proposals, in, uh, whether in the Chicago uh, uh, NATO summit and the, the last one, when we're talking about the new uh, strategic concept that the, this region is given a priority within the uh, uh, NATO perspectives. Okay. I'm, I'm conscious of our time, and I did want to come back to our group here for one last, for one last quick question. But before we do that, let me go just right over here in front. Not working. Not working. Um, hello, my name is Margot Le Guen. I am part of the uh, Emerging Leaders Program. Um, Mrs. Cinchilla, thank you very much for mentioning climate change as a common issue or common opportunity. Um, I work on climate adap adaptation in, in West Africa, and I was wondering if you could um, tell us more how you see the Atlantic community um, in, enhance collaboration on this particular um, issue and you know, why the Atlantic community could bring more than with uh, global discussions on this issue. Why not having a discussion with other country, including in Asia and, and in other part of the world, uh, would be, you know, productive. Thank you. So environment in the Atlantic. The environment. And why Atlantic rather than global for environment and climate? <laughs> um, uh, yeah, we're talking about environment, isn't it? Yes. About the environment, the, the point you made about environment and climate, and, and as a subject for Atlantic right. cooperation, and should it be global, or is the Atlantic has meaningful? to be? Okay. Um, well, when you analyze the situation, uh, the dramatic situation that those small countries I already mentioned are going through, um, and if you put a number on the price they are paying, uh, the Latin American Commission. Uh, the Economic Commission, the CEPAL, has estimated uh, that the effects of climate change uh, is causing to those countries about 5% of its GDP annually, mm. annually. But it is not only because they are paying. It is that what is at stake is its existence as a nation because they, some of them are very small and if we do not reverse the current situation, they are condemned to disappear. And when you go to the other side of the coin and analyze the cost just to comply with the Kyoto, um, the Kyoto uh, uh, commitments, uh, that will mean that the big nations, the industrialized nations, will have to invest less than one point of their GDP to comply with the Kyoto uh, rules. So that means that we have to act at a global level. Um, the big emissors of uh, 
carbon have to act and have to you know, com implement the Kyoto uh, rules. At the same time, in the short term, I would say that uh, the best instruments we have at hand are the NAPAs, the, uh, the, uh, the adaptations programs that are uh, um, uh, ruled by the uh, United Nations uh, Climate Change um, Convention. <coughs> and, but that means that also um, we have to put money uh, to assist those nations to implement the NAPA so they can be able at least, at least to mitigate the effects of climate change. So we have to act both at the global level and also at the uh, local level. Great. So before we end, and I am really conscious of the time, I'm going to get us back on schedule, uh, or at least close. Uh, I did want to just engage in a little thought experiment with you, if I could. And I apologize to all of you out there. I saw other hands who wanted to uh, come in, but I'm sure you will in other sessions. But a little thought experiment. We have this discussion next year at Atlantic Dialogues. What are we going to be talking about up here in this session? What's a, what, what is the new thing? Maybe it's things that are already on the agenda, but what are we going to be talking about when we discuss this next year? Maybe I could start with you, Miguel. Well, I'm sure that we will recall this uh, introductory session uh, in order that uh, we need more and more Atlantic dialogue. We need more and more, or we should create a kind of um, institutionalized mechanism in order to fill the gap still existing oh, between the two shores of the Atlantic. And that the threat of today, the opportunity of today, are going to be even intensified. The threat of uh, security, narcotraffic, uh, health, Ebola, and the opportunities, trade, energy, new relationship, so either we start immediately, the sooner we start to really advance in our relationship, the better. And next year we will, you know, even underline that we were right to establish the path for the next uh, step to be taken. Mr. Nchia, what are we going to be talking about next? What should we be talking about next year? Uh, what should we? Next year. Uh, We're sitting here again. Well, I, What's going to be I, the big issue? I, um, <sighs> I think that uh, what is important is to, um, to, to, uh, to, uh, to really analyze um, how the instruments that we already have in place um, are impacting on the real issues. Uh, that is something that is very, very important. The second issue is uh, that I think we have uh, to bring uh, key actors from the private and corporate sector and free and organized civil society. Uh, because uh, when we look at the way uh, some nations and some regions are solving part of the problems, they have to do not only uh, with um, a public response, uh, with uh, cooperation among the governments, but also with uh, the different activities that are reuniting many people from the both corporate and the civil society. So I think also that should be a, a emphasis that we should bring uh, to these dialogues. Esther. Perhaps a crystal we, ball. Oh, well, that's always dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> but perhaps maybe we could talk about how far we've gotten on a proposal which would be, if we think of all the bilateral work, whether it's 100,000 strong of sending students to other countries, couldn't we do that across the Atlantic? Maybe I'll challenge some of our foundation friends to say. And in fact, why not have a proposal where you say we will have 100,000 students in the Atlantic area and we will have a five-year exchange which would plan to send them to universities um, in other countries and link that to the corporate community which would commit to give them their first job when they're out. Maybe we could look at a procedure, something like that. Terrific. Okay, as Ambassador. I was as our objective is to build up a, a zone of peace, stability, and share prosperity, mm. I think we should build mm. more bridges. Mm. More bridges with the new tools, new actors, civil society, mm. new tools. An indirect connection, I, um, it's a question for you. Can we uh, use the tools of the uh, North Atlantic to South Atlantic? Mm. It's one of question, you know, maybe. Or should we do something else? But the most important is to build 
bridges for, this, for the zone of peace and stability based on shared values and, of course, trust, which is essential. Okay. You know, whenever you have these big picture discussions, there's always a little bit of a risk that you don't really get to substance. Uh, but, you know, I hope you'll all agree with me, uh, we did that. And uh, before we have our coffee break, would you please just join me in thanking all of our speakers for this Thank extraordinarily you. rich discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you. Let me just add my thanks to Ian's, to everyone on the panel. I think you got us off to a terrific start. And before we release you all for the coffee break, I'm gonna pick up the building bridges metaphor to say I need you all to help me build a bridge to dinner, which is after the <laughs> coffee break, we are having the second plenary session. And immediately following that session, I need everybody who's joining us at the opening dinner to get on the buses because the dinner is off-site. So if you were planning on running to your hotel room after the session before dinner, do it now. And I know that means <laughs> foregoing the coffee break, but we don't want you left behind when the, all the rest of us get on the buses and go to dinner. So just to remind, we'll leave right after the next session for dinner. So with that in mind, please enjoy the coffee break and we look forward to continuing. Thank you. Thank you very much.